Yeah. Get it on. Welcome back to Vasty Fool. What do you buy? Fed Lab and Tower Nutrition and by Maxa and Capital Cycles. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Well, uh, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about uh, some aerodynamics data analysis. I did um, to compare just what happens if you ride your regular bog standard road bike um, and compare that to some really nice data from exactly the same scenario but on a full hardcore TT rig. So I've got all those numbers and data to show you. I had quite a few questions from people over time, which is something like, you know, over a 20k or a 40k TT, what sort of difference would do you see when you fork out for, you know, disc wheels and TT frames and get into the TT position? Well, now I know. So I'll show you what that is in a minute. Um, and there's a uh, cool event coming up this weekend known as the Carapodi Classic. Um, this used to be a giant race, but I think numbers have fallen down a little bit in the last few years. Um, but it's still pretty big and very prestigious. I'm doing it for, you know, I put down in the entry, maybe I've done it seven or eight times, but I think I've probably done it maybe nine or ten, something like that. I think you have to do it 15 you get in the Hall of Fame, maybe 20, so, uh, you know, slowly working my way there. I have a lot of uh, riders who this race is important for. I'd like to go out and do okay if I can. It just, it, this would blow your mind. Uh, 20 years ago, I, it's 20, I was second in this race, and um, to Tim Vincent, and I remember it. And 19 years ago, wait, 20 years ago, I was third in the race. And 19 years ago, I was second in this race. A few sort of top 10 and top five finishes in Karapoti. So I'll tell you my thoughts about, as, as we're only like four or five days away from it now, what I think is important. And I did go and recon the course last week. I'll tell you what shape... It's in, and I'll give you my predictions for the top, for the podium. All right, so let's go back and look at this thing um, I was talking about, which was comparing the uh, the aerodynamics data. Let's click on here from uh, two time trials. So I've got some pretty decent data here from um, from. Last year, this is the Wellington Masters Cycling Club individual time trial, a little standalone event really, out and up a small time trial, 21 and a half Ks, and um, so this is last year's data you're looking at, so a time of 30 minutes, oh, 30 minutes and 18 seconds, 21.1 Ks, Climbing 178 meters, work 596 kilodoles, maybe two hamburgers, or maybe one, one and a half, something like that. Average speed, this is on the TT bike, 41.8 kilometers an hour. Average power, 338 watts, heart rate 165, yada, yada, yada. So, the, the good thing is um, that this was 14th of January 2018 that I did that time on my whole time trial rig. I did actually have a, um, I didn't have my proper front wheel because it was in there. And it was back when I was using a Zip 404. And um, still do when it's windy. Um, but for this particular event, the only thing that was not standard time trial set up was I just had this old Mavic Helium wheel on the front because my other wheel was in the shop. I've got it in the notes up here on the screen. So um, that would have affected my drag a little. 
my normal drag would have been about 0.26 and that front wheel change in itself yeah, it probably cost me an extra 10 to 15 watts over a Zip 404 giving me a drag of about 0.7 to 0.28 alright so so that's what we've got so let's say this is last year very low wind conditions of it you know really very similar the, the road was in the same shape obviously it's the same course same distance um it's really same weather conditions so let's see what difference it makes if you hop on a different bike this different bike by the way being um a 1995 colnago master olympic steel classic steel um Columbus frame and it's um, got those Mavic Heliums on it just because I wanted something period to put on it. I like this old bike. Hey, if I, if I put on the photo booth, here you go. Should I show you what it looks like? Let's see if I can feel my bikes out there. It is. It's my baby. This Bella there. If you're looking at the screen, that's her hanging out there. And um, yeah, I went with the pink bar tape. And sort of, uh, sort of a sort of a nod to the Giro. Um, all things Italian, the pink highlights. You get it. So that's what I was riding this last time I did the time trial. So let's see what difference it makes using an old school bike like that. Which, by the way, is probably even though it's 20 years old or what is that? Close to 15. What is it? No five to thirty. Yeah, holy crap! More than twenty years old. That, that's gonna um, have really similar drag to any other most non-aero road bikes. Okay, so what's the difference? Well, I worked out the drag actually. It's about my drag on that bike in the drops was about 0.35 to 0.36, so a lot higher. I mean, if you're gonna figure that out in wattage. I don't know, a lot, maybe 100 watts. Um, now, I don't have, you'll notice first thing, I don't have power data for this, so don't freak out. I'm pretty used to time trialing and knowing my power output to the stage. I will, I will very happily say to within 5% or so that my power would have been identical to last year. I mean, I can tell you now, I know what 330, 340 watts feels like. I just do. And um, so it, it sounds wildly subjective, but it's really not. Um, I know that my heart rate at that power as well in that position. It's different to the TT bike, but it's, I kind of know it. So here's what I'm saying is, is, even though I don't have the objective data, I'm sure my power level would have been within 10, 15, maybe 20 watts. So you, you can really discount that. That's, that's what means that I can get a fairly accurate drag figure too. Um, that gave me a total of 32.28. So what are we saying? That's a total of, what well, average speed, 38.7 kilometers an hour versus full time trial condition, 30, uh, 41.8. So that's a full, um, you know, two kilometers an hour or so slower on average um top speeds lower as well that's not so important so let's just do a side by side comparison so uh full tt bike total moving time of 30 minutes 18 seconds road bike moving time 32 28 so two and a bit minutes two minutes and 10 seconds or thereabouts is what uh, full time trial setup is worth. So, um, so that's that. So that's that was an interesting little bit of, you know, data. I just had the opportunity to grab. I was originally going to ride. The club said they needed a um, volunteer, so I just I volunteered, and then on the day they didn't need me, so I decided to just ride as I was. So hopefully that's an interesting, um, interesting thing to know. So. What, how much for the thousands of dollars that you spend on a TT bike? Well, you're buying, call that two minutes for 20Ks. 
it's, it's about being on, you've probably um, four minutes in a 40k TT form for maybe just over four minutes is what you are buying for a TT setup. And by the way, um, you don't really need to point out that, you know, that's obviously the difference between <laughs> being on the podium and being way down in a TT. And even if you had a road bike set up with some clip-on aero bars, that is going to help quite a lot because it, most of that drag comes from your position, but it's not going to be the same. And lots of tweaks like wheels and stuff do give you quite a lot extra. I mean, even if, you know, you could somewhat quantify it by saying, well, if you had a road bike, maybe even with um, shallow aero wheels and you put some clip-on bars on there, so meaning that you can lower your body position, you know, present less frontal area. So it's sort of halfway between a road bike, standard road bike setup and a TT setup. Let's say you're looking at two minutes or so as a, as a rough estimate in a 40 kilometer TT. So hopefully that helps you maybe decide whether or not it's worth it for you to actually invest in um, a TT bike, if that's what you want to go and do. <laughs> right, so let's talk about the Karapoti Classic. So this is um, a 44.5k ride out in Upper Hutt. It's famous for, you know, being rocky, kind of slow, steep, um, not, not wildly fun in most respects. The, um, the fastest time ever set on this course, I think, was Anton Cooper in about 2015 or thereabouts. He's not on the Strava list here, but I think from memory, he did like something like a 208 or 209. And I, if memory serves me, I think that was including the fact he got a puncture. So without a puncture, he probably would have been close to two. Probably, no, wouldn't have, wouldn't have beaten two hours, but no. Uh, would have been close to that since saying my best time when I got second in this race 19 years ago was like 229, I think. So the course has um, over the last 10 years sped up a bit, mainly because of grading and improving uh, the piece which goes from the top of the first major climb, Deadwood, and the traverse that goes from the top of that to the start of a piece called the Rock Garden which is the most technical, difficult uh, descent in the, in the course. So maybe what I'll do is I'll just do a quick fly through of the course. And based on my recon um, a week ago, any thoughts I've got about it, um, the river crossing and the road piece is all the same, the gorge is in much better condition. So the gorge where you start after about 2Ks into the ride and then you ride the next 5Ks or so up the gorge is known for its big puddles and um, rocky sections. W when I rode it, all of the puddles were gone. I think partly because it's been dry and partly because it's been drained out of it um, by people. So that was much better because you don't have to steer around puddles so much. That's good. Uh, first climb is called the warm-up climb, so-called because it comes just before the major deadwood climb. That's all in the same sort of shape as always, kind of rocky. You can um, you can certainly climb all of warm-up climb without too many troubles. I mean, it is steep and rocky, but not nearly so rocky as deadwood, which is next up. And that's really the same shape as it always is. And I feel like um, maybe if there's a hint about this area, is really... Sometimes I feel like you struggle to, and use a lot of energy to try to stay on your bike and pedal up, but a lot of the sections are so steep and rough that I feel like it's probably better to jump off, save a little energy, push your bike, maybe rather than carry your bike up the steep sections, and it's probably really not going to cost you any time. It might save you energy, so, you know, it's super rough. Deadwood Traverse the piece over the ridge that goes from the top of Deadwood to uh, 18Ks in or so, the top of 
uh, the rock garden. Same as always. Um, you know, it's, it's got these little little descents. You can actually see in the profile here. Little descents followed by little climbs. It's not really hard to get your pace on. It's maybe a weird little tip. So I'm just going to make sure I'm running lowish tire pressures because, you know, if you're running tubeless, you don't really have to worry too much about a puncture. Um, well, at least a snake bite puncture. But um, if you run low pressures, it's like you can keep your momentum a bit better because your tire deforms around an object rather than, you know, hit it and bounce off it. And that can keep your forward momentum a little better. Sounds silly, but in this, you know, this is a lot of stuff which is sub 15, sub 10, sub, you know, 8 kilometer an hour stuff. Keeping forward momentum is pretty important. Rock Garden is the same as always. There's, the main new feature is for two or maybe three of the large drops in Rock Garden, there are alternate lines to the left which have been created, which are new. And, um, if you know that and line up towards the left, uh, you'll see them, take them. That probably will save you a bit of time and is obviously a safer option than the big drops. That's um, something I'll be taking. The river crossing and devil staircase is much the same as it always has been. Devil staircase over the last couple of years is sort of reverting back to what it used to be. It used to be just super, just super steep super kind of, it's that compact clay that kind of gets a bit of mossy, oggy kind of stuff on it, and it, it gets quite slippery, and about three years ago, that was graded, and even though it was graded, and the surface was much better, you still couldn't really ride it, because it was so steep, it's kind of halfway between what it used to be, the super rocky clay, weird, steep, unrideable stuff, uh, and there's still a bit of the fact that it's graded, so it's faster than it was 10 years ago, but it's, it's reverting back. The top and the Big Ring Boulevard are all the same. Uh, the river crossing and then Dope is the final major climb at 31 k's. That is different actually, it has been graded. The bottom section is rocky and hard, but only for about 200 meters. After that it opens up and it's pretty good. And it basically gets better and better as you climb. By you get time you get halfway up, and by the way, it's close to a 20 minute climb, even at race pace. It, it does get better and better, so just get a good rhythm on. It's pretty smooth, there's good traction, nothing really to worry about. Uh, the top and then the <clears throat> return all the way back down as much the same as it always was. So, probably the biggest differences are the alternate lines down Rock Garden to the left and the um, condition of dopers. All of that bodes quite well for a good time at Carapodi, I think. So I'm gonna pick uh, the um, winners now and times. I think um, this is, if the weather keeps up, the weather forecast is good and it has been dry. So if I think that picks up uh, and some guys really bring their A game, you'll be looking to 2.15 uh, winning time, um, 2 to 10 to 2.15 winning time, I think it's doable, certainly sub 2.20. Now if we look at who's entered, see who I like here, uh, what have we got? Oh by the way, i just go back, here's the results for the uh, time trial last weekend I was talking about, Jack Polly, nice guy, taking the win. 30 minutes and 25, just missing my KOM by about 7 or 8 seconds or whatever it was. Good for Jack. Uh, Pete Mora coming back after being beaten by Mike Proudfoot the previous week. Um, 3103, so about half a minute back. 3109, so just Pete Mora, just pipping Mike Proudfoot. About 6 seconds or whatever that is. Uh, followed by me. And fourth on my Colnago, about a minute and 21 seconds back from that. So um, even if I had been on my TT rig, I would have got serious uh, competition from Pete Moore and Jake Polly, especially. Wow, it's windy out there.
All right, so let's go back and um, look at entries. So this is the entries. I'm going to talk about the 50K Pro Elite men and women. Let's just go down the list. Amy Hayden, I don't know. Glenn Hayden, maniac from uh, Taranaki, I think, up that way. He will be good. He won the, um, I think, the non-pro version of the Gravel and Tar or something this year. I've raced against him on the mountain bike. Uh, complete savage. He will be very good. Uh, Brenda Fisher, Glenn Johnson, Brendan Sharrett, old stage, kind of like me, but a better rider all round, really. Uh, I may be able to stay with him on some of the longer climbs, but technically, he will eat me up and spit me out. Callum Kennedy, kind of the all rounder of the group, kind of good everywhere. Not the best at anything, but the top, <laughs> the top echelon of everything. Um, and super consistent, he'll be good. Ben Earnshaw, Sam Shepard, she'll be good. Uh, of course, on the course, she's one of the few people to beat Kim Hurst. Ed Crossling, uh, previous winner. Kind of like um, <laughs> Callum, just all round good at everything. Stephen McKinstry, real good climber. Kate McElroy, hey, there's a lineup. No one more for a road stuff, but there is no one. A no better climber she, uh, than in the women's than Kate. And by the way, she probably outclimb most of the dudes, including me. Uh, Steve Bale, Sam Shaw, who I think's good. I don't know much about him. Nick Smith, Kim Hess, of course, who's won this event before and is good all round. Uh, and it's not telling you who else. There's only two other entries, but here's what I'm saying. Here's what I like for the podium and the men's. Uh, I'm going to say it's going to be real close between Brendan, Sharrett, Glenn Hayden, and I'm going to say Callum Kennedy. I'm going to say, um, I'm going to say, based on what I've seen, I, I think, I think Glenn for the win followed closely by Brendan, uh, with running it out with Callum, I think. That's how I think the men's is going to go in the women's. I think if technically if things go okay for um, Kate, that she will have such insane uh, climbing legs that she will win ahead of uh, Sam Shepard and Kim Hurst, who will be close. That's what I think. And now I have to apologise to all those people because, of course, I've mentioned them. No, I've completely jinxed them. Hey, maybe that's a cunning plan on my part, because if I jinx all those guys, then I can maybe sneak in with a, with a safe ride from Steve Bale. We will see. All right, so that's what I think. Here's a little bit of tech for you as well. Just one last thing. You might like this. Here's a tech hack. All right, someone in the bike shop showed me this. I'll put it back on. Photo booth mode, so you can see what I'm talking about. All right, check this out. This is my, you can see, just a little bit of active recovery here. Text Neo, the bike I'll be riding on the weekend. Let's get used to the muscle firing pattern. I'm going to let's just go in a little closer. I'm sorry, this isn't ideal to be doing on here, but look at this. What have we here? This is on my left brake and shifter. And I know, it doesn't look like anything special, right? This is just an XT shifter, three, three speed. But hang on, look down here, I'm running a single ring. What is going on? Well, people, this little hack from the good people at Capital Cycles is that this shifter does not control any kind of front derailleur, and in fact controls the fork lockout. And RockShox lockouts um, wildly notorious for being crap and breaking almost instantly. I'm not joking. I got some grit in one. Went around the carapodi, it was broken in, you know, one go. Uh, you attach this, and by the way, so that only gives you an on or off, so I'm using a rock shot tree before here. Okay, so by using the pre-position shifter, 
cabling that in, you get three positions. So you get full lockout, you get your halfway between lockout and fully open. You might want to use that. You know, use it fully locked out for climbing, steep stuff. Use it halfway when you're maybe going to be in and out of the saddle. Maybe it's still a little rough. But you don't want full fork movement. Then a third position, a third click on the shifter there, opens it up fully um, for full fork movement on downhill sections. So that's a little setup, and I think that's neat. Heavier than, um, you know, a rich, regular, regular rock shocks lockout. But, um, but has much better reliability. Um, and I, you know, I've been using this for, I don't know, two or three years and it's been fine. Um, and gives you that extra position. So I'm running the, uh, my old Chinese hardtail. Here's another thing. I bought this Chinese 29er. I'm going to say five, four or five years ago. I used it for a couple of seasons. I trained on it. I used it. Her name's Dolores, by the way. Fessy on Strava. Got her, uh, got her name in there. Dolores. This is Dolores. I sold it to a friend of mine down the road, Jared. He rode it and raced it for a couple of years. I bought it back off him about six months or a year ago. Built it up and I've been riding it. And it's been fine. And, um, look, I know I've got had a few Chinese bikes and introduced a few people to the concept, and that's good. My experience riding something like uh, the Cannondale Super 6, Colnago for that matter, the Chapter 3, they all ride a little better than the Chinese stuff. They, they just do. They're a little lighter. They ride a bit better. And, you know, that's probably indisputable, but here's the thing. I don't really think as far there's no... I think the thing is like the thing on people's mind where they go, oh yeah, they're worried that it's going to break and they're going to, I maybe not get any after sales help, which isn't true if it's a warranty matter, or it's you know going to break and hurt them. None of that has happened. I've had behind me that's my hour bike. If you're looking at the screen, that's been fine. I've had multiple rigid forks. I've got the a dual suspension bike there if you can see it, um, but I rode a bunch. I've got a uh, rain bike I've got now, male TT bike, um, two other mountain bikes, another track bike, um, all this stuff, which some of which I've still got, some of which I've sold. N- never had a single break or joint thing on all of it. So here's what I'd say. Yeah, whatever R&D is going into brand name bikes does have an effect. But if you're on a budget... And, you know, you want to build up something that just works and does, I've got to say this, guys, does have great aftermarket, after sales service in all my experience. So seeing back emails really quick and stuff like that. If you can get around the language stuff, Chinese stuff works good. And that's that's what the Laura is. So I'm happy with it. The frame itself, you know, a really high-end hardtail carbon frame you're going to be sub one kilo probably. But, of course, you know, that's eye-wateringly expensive, you know, thousands of dollars. Old Dolores, while I think she's maybe 100 or 200 grams heavier than that, um, she is, I'm going to say, sub 500 US dollars. So I think it was... Now, maybe land on your doorstep. Could have been 600, 700 New Zealand, something like that. And the custom paint, you can specify. Look, here's what I'm saying. I don't know. I don't, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I'm just saying from experience, it's been pretty great. I've got some stuff on my blog about contacts and stuff. If you want any help, uh, just let me know. So, that's what I'd say. All right, what are we at? Well, that's it. Let's make the recovery over. All right, it's good times. I'm excited about the Carapodi. Don't do it that often anymore. What I want to do as well as I can. And I'll be um, pushing the pace as hard as I can. So I'll see you guys out there. As always, if you like a coaching plan or lactate testing from me, 
you can get hold of me, steve at fitlab.co.nz, or you can get hold of me or our team of guys throughout New Zealand via our website, fitlab.co.nz. You can see discount codes for all my supporters underneath this video on YouTube or on my blog, Biomexa, Fitlab, Capital Cycles, Tail Nutrition. Uh, so, good times. Come see me. Grab a Fitlab bottle on the weekend or a sample of Cramp Fix or Biomexa. I'll see you on the weekend.